Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rick Doblin. He's the founder and executive director of the Multidisciplinary Association for, the, uh, for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS for short. Uh, he received his doctorate in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he wrote his dissertation on the regulation of the medical uses of psychedelics and marijuana. Rick studied with Dr. Stanislav Graf and was among the first to be certif certified as a holotropic breathwork practitioner. His professional goal is to help develop legal contexts for the beneficial uses of psychedelics and marijuana, primarily as prescription medicines, but also for personal growth and for otherwise healthy people. Eventually, he hopes to become a legally licensed, licensed psychedelic therapist. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Doblin. Thank you. Uh, uh, the the uh, tribute here to Stan is really well timed because uh, four days from now, my father turns 88. And I feel that Stan is my um, professional and spiritual father. So I'm able to be celebrating both of them in very close proximity. <laughs> um, I, I will say briefly about what Tom just told you, that um, if we had 1% 1 of $1.5 billion, which is $15 million, we could make um, MDMA into a medicine. That's um, an estimate. It's not 100% sure. And then the other fact is that 90% of our money comes from the top 1% uh, of our donors. So when I started MAPS, I did have that similar idea, that there are tens of millions of people out there that are doing these different drugs, and if we can just get a few dollars from each of them, then we'd be set. But I think most of these people would rather spend a few dollars and buy another drug. <laughs> so I, I do think I've moved more and more to the uh, you know, major donor approach. Uh, but I think with uh, 15 million, we could create an engine of a sustainable nonprofit that would be able to generate income from the sale of psychedelic medicines to produce uh, research to generate new psychedelic medicines. And so what I'm gonna um, talk about very briefly today is just how um, probably without Stan there wouldn't be a MAPS. I don't know what I would be doing with my life. Um, and so I'm gonna, um, share with you a little bit of my evolution and how it interacted with Stan and how that ended up uh, really producing MAPS and the work that we're doing and then how Stan uh, has influenced how MAPS does what it does. I was um, born Jewish in 1953 and was heavily um, educated about the Holocaust as I was growing up and I think I was like a multi-generational trauma in a way. So I just grew up aware of the power of the irrational and how important that was uh, to cope with in some way or another. Um, then I started learning about Hiroshima, about the World War II, and I had the um, reinforcing uh, aspect of uh, being around 10 years old during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And really having that kind of a situation in school where we're uh, you know, told to hide under your desk and you'll be fine and duck and cover. And so again, this idea of not just annihilation of Jews but annihilation of the whole world was something that was a real phenomena. Um, but then I also became aware a little bit of uh, the concerns that intellectuals had. This is um, Albert Einstein, has it become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity? Um, then uh, I have my bar mitzvah. <laughs> and um, my bar mitzvah, despite my best hopes, you know, did, did not turn me into a man. And I had thought somehow I would vault all over this uh, you know, uncomfortable adolescence and I would have this uh, transformative experience through this you know, centuries, thousands of years old ritual, but it really didn't do much for me. Um, this is from uh, the Cone Brothers, A Serious Man, where uh, he just smoked pot, right, right in the bathroom, right, right before he has to read from the Torah. Um, <laughs> um, this is a, a picture of me as a 16-year-old. Um, I, I was very interested in the other and my parents sent me to Russia. I, I studied Russian in high school in order to, to really understand the other. And so I spent the summer um, in Russia 
learning the language, but also uh, meeting with the young Russian underground kids, because I could speak Russian. And I was with a group of about 60 high school students, and me and two other guys were the uh, designated uh, liaisons to selling all our stuff. <laughs> um, we had a copy of Abbey Road by the Beatles, sold for 100 rubles. Uh, it cost like two bucks. Um, we had all sorts of stuff. So, so here it is, I, I've got thousands of rubles, I'm lighting a Cuban cigar. Um, but the important thing here is that I went for a walk on the beach where we were with a Russian girl. And I was just super shy in high school. But to be able to have a friendly conversation with somebody from a culture that I was trained wanted to kill us and were in a deathly battle for control of the world with, and to see that that wasn't really what she was interested in, it wasn't what I was interested in, that there was a lot more that we had in common than different. So I started being radicalized at this early age and recognizing that really we, we are all in this together. Um, and then I had to cope with Vietnam. And I was in the last year of the lottery. And I was trying to figure out um, really how to address that. I didn't really want to kill people. I didn't really see that they were the enemies. I didn't feel that they were a threat. Um, and this was, of course, the civil rights period. And so I um, read this from Martin Luther King. Um, I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscious tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. So based on this, I decided that I was going to be a draft resistor and I was going to go to jail. And my parents were sympathetic, but they were like, okay, you're not going to be able to be a doctor or a lawyer or anything that requires a license. So I was now adrift uh, in my career, but I, I felt like uh, killing people was not a price I was willing to pay to have a traditional career. And needless to say, I was also in the era of uh, Timothy Leary and the whole psychedelic 60s, and I initially thought LSD made you permanently crazy. It was something that if you even took it just once, you were always off balance and in serious risk of um, mental institutions. And in something, but I believed that initially. And there was this whole thing about tune in, turn on, drop out. I was raised to sort of be part of the mainstream. I didn't really like this idea of dropping out. But it was, uh, LSD became the symbol of cultural rebellion and it got connected up with the Beatles who were protesting the Vietnam War. So that started making me wonder, maybe this isn't a social menace. Maybe this drug really has some kind of um, important potential for consciousness. But it, was, um, it wasn't exactly clear to me what to do. And so my image of myself at age 18 was that I was a counterculture, drug-using, draft-resisting criminal. <laughs> And fortunately, I had a trust fund from my grandfather that wasn't a whole lot, but it was enough to pay for food and rent. And so that made me independent in my mind. I thought, okay, now I can do anything that I want. I don't have a whole lot of needs. If I just have survival covered, uh, and I can't be something normal. Uh, and so I started doing LSD more and more as a way to try to get in touch with myself. And it was very difficult because I was so emotionally constricted, really overly intellectualized, and I had these series of um, increasingly difficult trips where I could never let go. I would get to this point, I had one trip where I was feeling that my brain was melting, it was sloshing around in my head, and I had like a nasal drip, and I was convinced that that was my brain leaking out <laughs> because I was resisting so much. And that it was overheating, and, and so, I, I was, but I, I felt like I had to do something, you know, and so I, I kept doing it, but I finally uh, was at this college, and I decided I need to go talk to the guidance counselor and get some advice. And so this is where um, the turning point of my life took place. I went to the guidance counselor, and lo and behold, he gives me a manuscript copy of Realms of the Human Unconscious. <laughs> in 1972, before it was even published. And when I read that book, I was just utterly transformed and shocked because there was something about the way Stan wrote about it and the values that he had in there and the, the science that he was talking about 
that it all came clear to me what I needed to do. And what I felt Stan was doing is it wasn't um, philosophy, which in a sense could go on and on forever. It wasn't about power. I was reading uh, Carlos Castaneda at the time, and if you look at the, the books, they're about struggles for power. One of them was called Tales of Power. And I think you can actually see in some ways, that's why I think Castaneda went off the path. Um, and it wasn't dogma. Stan was really coming from, uh, it was about spirituality, but it was science, it was the mystical experience. It had the unit of aspect that had political implications, and it had the reality check of healing. And I think that mix of elements made me feel like this is, I felt home. I felt this is what I need. I need science, I don't trust religion. You know, science is more my religion, but I need spirituality and I felt the political implications were there. And so I started reading more and more of, of what Stan was writing, and then I, I learned about the Good Friday experiment. And what that was was further scientific uh, confirmation that people could have what was either resembling like or actually a genuine spiritual experience, and people reported positive benefits from it. Um, and the core of it was a sense of unity. And so I think this idea that we live in a world where there's, um, Stan talked about just a little bit earlier about how there's uh, religion makes you divide into us and them. And that there's not enough empathy for the other. There's not enough identification with the, they're not really the other. We're all in this together. And I think the mystical experience which didn't come to me from my bar mitzvah, and which I think doesn't come to most people through the religion that they were born into and that we experience. Um, here was a way with psychedelics, and it felt like uh, Stan was saying it was genuine. And then um, I learned that it was part of the Western cultural heritage. It wasn't some foreign thing. It had been for 2,000 years, the world's longest mystery ceremony, the Eleusinian Mysteries, involved the psychedelic drug, involved the mystical experience, and it was wiped out in 396 by the Catholic Church. But it's part of our you know, Western cultural history. So it didn't seem alien. And then I read this from Albert Einstein, the splitting of the atom has changed everything save our mode of thinking, and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. We shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. So what is this new manner of thinking? I think it's about, you know, what Fritjof Kapper is talking about, it's about this sense of togetherness. It's about how we really share more in common than not. And if we can think that way, then maybe we can save ourselves from what's going on. Uh, I read the UNESCO charter, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And all of this really um, led me in the summer of 1972 to go to take a seminar with Stan and Joan Halifax. And that uh, was a great experience. It really confirmed uh, for me. But uh, you know, my main memory, I was like this 18-year-old. Uh, and, and so Stan would, and <laughs> Joan, would, they would be there during the, the scheduled times, but then be, they'd be gone. You know, and, and they had just gotten married like a week before, something like that. So I just, we all had this rumor, they were off doing this special thing called tantric sex, and that that was like this magical, mystical thing. But I, I, um, I felt like, um, again, I, the, the, the road was clear, but I wasn't able to um, fully embrace it. I wasn't mature enough. I couldn't really... Uh, do it, but I did change my self-concept. So now I was a countercultural, drug-using, draft-resisting criminal with trust funds to pay for food and rent, but my career goal now was to become a legal psychedelic psychotherapist and to bring psychedelic psychotherapy back. And it was in order to provide an antidote to all these things that I felt were imperiling me and, and the world. And so finally I had this anchor in my life. This is now what I'm gonna try to do. And it took basically um, 10 years of working little bits of LSD, small trips on my own, um, not being connected in any way with the psychedelic community, just reading books, trying to work on myself, getting grounded, building houses, being in construction. 
And after 10 years, I felt ready to go back. And so where I went was Esalen. And I went back 10 years later and did uh, a week-long and then a month-long workshop with Stan and Christina. And what I was so impressed by, and I think one of the most important things that I learned from uh, from Stan and Christina was the work with the breath work. Because when the main road, it's like a river falling you know, down the hill. When there's an obstacle, the river goes around it. But it's still going in the same direction, more or less. So the work with m most people had involved with psychedelics had left to do non-drug alternative, different kind of things. But I think holotropic breath work is evocative and psychedelic in its own right. And it's with breath that cannot easily be made illegal. <laughs> and, and so I just was really impressed with the way that Stan and Christina f kept going forward, that they found a way creatively. And that, that has been sort of a, um, a message for me through the rest of my life. Um, the other thing is I, I learned about MDMA at that workshop, not from Stan and Christina. Somebody came to Esalen um, who happened to be there and talked to me and others about MDMA. And my first thought was, this is not very interesting. I mean, this is supposed to help me feel better and you can talk more with people. And I saw groups of people doing it together and just sitting around talking. And I'm like, I love the fireworks of LSD, the drama of mescaline. And here, they, they don't even seem like they're affected that much. They're just sitting around talking. They're, they're still conscious in the same way that they were before. And I, I, but I was smart enough to buy some <laughs> and, and take it home. And uh, w once I did that, I was um, amazed at, at how subtle it was and how deep and powerful it was. Um, and it was still legal. And I felt like I came to the party of LSD too late. Right after it was shut down, I woke up to what the potential was. And now here it was, I learned about MDMA when it was still legal. And I started trying to get more and more involved. And one of the things I did was write to um, Robert Mueller, who was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And he had just written this book uh, New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And he was the mystic of the UN, there for about 30 years or so. And what he basically was saying is that we have the religions of the world and they're in conflict. We have the United Nations to mediate conflicts between nations, but we don't have really anything to mediate conflicts between religions. And what he said would do that would be the mystics and that the mystics of the different religions would have things uh, similar to each other and they, they would appreciate each other. And if we could have people move from fundamentalism to mysticism and a global spirituality, that would be a deeper source, a grounding of peace. And I wrote to him and I said, I really understand what you say, but you don't say a word about psychedelics in your book. And I told him about the Good Friday experiment, I told him about MDMA, and to my shock, he wrote me back. And he ended up, um, encouraged me to write to a bunch of different people that were mystics. Uh, Brother David Steindelrost, uh, Vanya Palmers, uh, Rabbi Zalman Schachter, uh, Wayne Teasdale, um, all these people. And you know, the subtext was, send them MDMA. <laughs> so, um, so, so I did that. Um, and, 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 and they also reported back to him. And, and actually, one of the things I'll just say that, that um, one of the ironies, I think, of Stan and Paul's life together is that when the DEA tried to criminalize MDMA um, in the United States, and we filed a lawsuit to try to stop that. Then it became clear to us that the DEA was trying to criminalize MDMA internationally through the WHO, and that Paul was the chairman of the committee of the WHO expert committee that was evaluating the data about whether MDMA should be criminalized or not. Absolutely astonishing. And Robert Mueller helped me to go to the committee and present information about MDMA. And they unanimously, except for Paul, voted to criminalize MDMA over the objections of the chairman. Paul was the chairman. And you know, there was able to be a little footnote that said that um, this could inhibit research. Nations of the world should facilitate research. And a few years later, so it felt like a big defeat. They, they voted to criminalize, but this tiny little victory. But only a few years later, the Swiss government cited that to open the door to MDMA research in Switzerland in 1988. And so it was the Stan Paul connection that kind of helped that to happen. Um, and then I started doing uh, research. I did a follow-up to the Good Friday experiment. 
because in the 80s you couldn't get permission to give MDMA or any psychedelics to anybody, but you could ask people about their reflections of something that had happened before. You could do a long-term follow-up. And because Walter Pankey had died in the scuba diving accident, uh, he would have done this if he was alive, but nobody. So I did a 25-year follow-up, and I interviewed these people. And what they, um, I found them, that was hard enough, but then I, I found them and I interviewed them, and what they said was that the um, mystical experience they felt was valid, they felt that it had long-term implications, they felt that it contributed to their movements with social justice activism, it increased their tolerance of other religions, deepened equanimity in the face of difficult life crises, greater solidarity and identification with foreign peoples, minorities, women in nature, they were all men, and reduced the fear of death. So again, this is a confirmation of the political implications of the mystical experience, whether it's psychedelic or not. And so um, this led me to think, okay, we're gonna try to start, MAPS is gonna try to do nonprofit drug development. And at the time, there had never been any drug developed by a nonprofit organization in 1986 when I started MAPS. But in 1999 was the first drug that succeeded in becoming a medicine, and it was the abortion pill, RU46, funded by the Rockefellers, the Pritzkers, and the Buffets. Of, of Warren Buffett donated about $10 million. It was John D. Rockefeller's Population Council, and then the Pritzkers put in a bunch of money, too. So now, um, we're actually been getting funding from the Pritzkers and the Rockefellers. We're, we're waiting for the Buffets, <laughs> and then I think uh, MDMA will be a medicine. Um, in 2000, One World Health began as a nonprofit to build drugs, create drugs for uh, the third world, the Gates Foundation stuff, MAPS, and Hefter. So nonprofit drug development is not so unusual. Um, and so in the methods that we are trying to develop um, psychedelics into medicines, particularly MDMA, we've learned a lot from what Stan has done. And I would say that the entire therapeutic approach that we have, you heard from Michael and Annie and Charlie, um, we look for therapists that have been through the breathwork training. Michael and Annie have been through the breathwork training. The person who was in charge of our Canadian study, um, Ingrid Pacey, was also in that uh, early group of people that Diane talked about. So. We look for people who've done breathwork training, and at the same time, in our therapist training programs, we utilize breathwork. And we have done that. Uh, we brought people from a bunch of different countries for our first training in Austria. Uh, and these were people who were legitimate mainstream psychiatrists and others. They wouldn't do something illegal, but we could do breathwork with them. Uh, and then in the, the actual therapeutic approach, in the treatment manual, again, we've learned from Stan. And so what we're primarily doing is a non-directive approach, believes in the inner healer, the wisdom of the psyche. We're not um, the guide, we're the sitter, the supporter. And we let it come and emerge from the, the psyche, from the, the person themselves. We have this fundamental trust that's really hard to have without going through it, and which I drew a lot of strength from Stan and Christina and others, is that if you can learn to trust this death rebirth process, when you feel like you're about to die, you're not gonna come back, you could go crazy. If you can just let go and let something happen, as Rick Tarnas talked, the funeral pyre is letting, fully experiencing it. That's super hard to do, it's really scary, but that's kind of the essence of the treatment approach. And we use a male-female co-therapist team that um, was one of the ideas that Stan developed as well. And I think that's been a real key to our success in terms of um, how we do our studies, who's attracted to working with us, just that kind of balanced pairing. Not to say that you couldn't have two sensitive guys or one person or, you know, it's not like it has to be this way, but it's just it, it is a really good way to do things. And then the other thing that's kind of not really talked about much, but there is an enormous um, prejudice, I would say, in our culture for plant-based medicines. That if it's from nature, it's good. And if it's from the laboratory, it's somehow tainted by humanity. And you know, we had these discussions with uh, Terence McKenna about uh, you know he, others. You know, but but I think Stan was by his acknowledgement of the fundamental healing and spiritual potential of LSD, which was a synthetic molecule made by the mind of Albert Hoffman, that there's 
it, it's not about does it come from the plants or does it come from the lab. It's how you use it, what it is, and I think that's sort of something we don't really acknowledge, but I think that's really a strong counter to a lot of the cultural tendencies that we see that, that I learned from Stan. Now, we, we've had a lot of um, work trying to encounter, you know, work with the other. And, and for now, a lot of it is because I was a draft resistor, the other is the military. So it was extremely um, healing for me personally. Uh, this is Richard Rockefeller and Michael Midhofer. Uh, I had to take it really quickly because you're not supposed to have cameras in there. <laughs> um, but this was a meeting with the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, the Navy Surgeon General, where we were present, arranged by Richard. Um, the one notable thing you'll see about Michael there is that um, he, he um, cut off his ponytail for this meeting. And I think that was had for decades and decades. And, and I was like, I don't think you need to do it. And Richard was, well, you don't need to do it, but it can't hurt, maybe it'll help. Um, and so, you know, Michael changed a decades, decades pattern. And, um, and you're glad you did, right? Or at least we're glad you did. <laughs> And um, so, so it was so fundamentally healing. And uh, I just keep thinking about how in the 60s, the um, work was done to try to uh, levitate the Pentagon. And uh, they didn't really make much progress and they didn't get inside. So now we're getting inside with psychedelic healing. Um, and we also have... <laughs> uh, yeah. um, and then we have the support of Senator Rockefeller, who's on the Veterans Affairs Committee. He wrote this to the Assistant Secretary of Defense. Um, I'm writing to encourage you to explore innovative treatments for PTSD, including but not limited to MDMA. And the new head of the uh, VA, Robert McDonald, the night before his confirmation hearing, um, Jay had a meeting with him and said, you know, my uh, cousin Richard has died. This was his main legacy. This is very important for soldiers. I want you to make sure the VA continues to support MDMA research for PTSD. So, and this was the transformative meeting that Richard and I went to at the VA where they agreed to let us fund some collaborative studies with VA therapists. So we are really moving in collaboration with the VA. Um, this is, um, about, this is a chart about the legalization of marijuana. And, and the reason I'm trying to say this is that I'm, we're talking now a lot about medicines, but I began talking about how we need um, cultural change, we need millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people that are grounded in a mystical consciousness. And that that's really not a few politicians, but if we can have loads and loads of people. So here's how the medicine leads to that. That this is the attitude of Americans towards the legalization of marijuana. Um, the green at the top is no, the yellow at the bottom is yes. And in the first time in over 40 years, in around 2011, more, 50 per, more than 50% of the U.S. was in favor of medical marijuana. I mean, in legalization. But if you look here, um, I, this is where things start changing. The people's attitudes start changing. And that's 1996, when California and Arizona legalized medical marijuana. And exit polls have shown that the most important factor of why somebody votes for marijuana legalization is if they know a medical marijuana patient. It's not even if they smoke marijuana themselves. So I think the medicalization of psychedelics diminishes the fear and paranoia in the society, increases the balance of hope over fear, and will cause people to rethink prohibitionist policies and really make it so that these substances have a wider use beyond just people with clinical indications. Um, this is our drug development plan. Um, Amy Emerson, who developed it, used to work for Novartis and Chiron. So this is big pharma coming to help little maps work on psychedelic medicine. And it's pretty complicated. There's hundreds of steps in here, but it basically just shows 2021, and we don't need one and a half billion dollars. We just need 15 million dollars. And then we'll have um, the sale of prescription MDMA. Um, and one of the concerns that people have about the legalization of marijuana, and one of the concerns about even medical use of a lot of different drugs or psychedelics is you get unbridled American capitalism trying to maximize profit. And what you end up um, getting is a lot of people that are really scared about that. So what we're talking about right now is to um, create 
a benefit corporation to actually, so if MAPS as a nonprofit can help make MDMA into a medicine, then once it's a medicine, it's not a nonprofit thing anymore, but we don't want it to be for profit. So we're, we're gonna create a wholly owned benefit corporation where social benefit is what we maximize, not profit. And then we'll move forward. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and then we'll move forward with the training of uh, therapists. We'll set up a network of MAPS clinics. <laughs> And you know, other people will be able to do this as well. Um, then we'll have world peace. <laughs> it might take a little bit of time in between those, you know. And all of this really comes back to Stan, who had the courage in the midst of massive social condemnation of psychedelics to say, psychedelics used responsibly and with proper caution would be for psychiatry, what the microscope is for biology and medicine, or the telescope is for astronomy. And we are coming forward to fulfill the promise. Stan led the way, and it's so uh, proud for me to be here with you, Stan, and say that you're my spiritual professional father. <laughs> Thank you.